Um, and so Staph aureus is um, another uh, different species, obviously, of extracellular bacteria. And um, its uh, primary site of entry is now not the lung, but the skin. Uh, and so you have, um, again, this very complicated um, uh, Staph aureus cell that lives on the skin and interacts very, very closely with the extracellular matrix created by the skin. And your skin is constantly secreting different peptides and enzymes to regulate the bacteria that live on the skin. Uh, and, um, and, to, uh, and, and to avoid um, bacteria from get, being able to get through the skin. And um, uh, staph has a number of virulence factors, again, to shut down each of these um, different uh, pathways. And we'll talk about uh, some of them here in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, but so uh, eventually, uh, if you get a wound in particular, then all of these defenses that the skin has is constantly producing uh, it are uh, undermined. Um, and again, this is like this, con this, this, um, this ongoing milieu that your skin generates of um, fats and lipids and uh, enzymes and peptides to try to maintain uh, homeostasis with healthy bacteria on your skin. And this is, if you followed, there's, there's been a, a lot of popular literature recently that we shower too much and that we're washing all of this away all the time. And there's some truth to that in the, in the sense that there is this milieu of, of um, healthy uh, immune uh, regulatory molecules that are limiting the bacteria that can um, colonize our skin. So let's assume that we got a paper cut here and um, there was some staph nearby and it's going to migrate into the wound. And it has uh, the skin knowing that there's a wound will actually start uh, amping up the amount of antimicrobial peptides and, and other um, targets here. Um, but um, staph has again, a number of virulence factors that it's going to use to try to neutralize those. And so um, represented down here is actually a neutrophil hanging out in the skin. Um, so these are um, represented uh, a, a little shorthand for neutrophils is uh, polymorph uh, polymorphic uh, uh, neutrophil, and that's based on this, this uh, shape of its nucleus. So this is the nucleus um, of a neutrophil as this sort of um, poly um, separated uh, shape rather than a nice uh, single round nucleus that you'll see in a lymphocyte. And so the neutrophil as an innate immune cell is gonna be loaded with these uh, innate recognition uh, um, uh, genes like uh, TLRs and I have a, a blow up side of this uh, later, and it's gonna sense that the bacteria is there. And so it's going to start secreting cytokines and it's going to um, start calling in more neutrophils from the bloodstream. And so this is now the endothelial layer lining the blood. Um, so this is a, you know, a capillary or a, uh, an artery of the blood, and you're gonna have neutrophils exiting from the um, bloodstream to go try to deal with this. And um, this should maybe look a little bit familiar. It's totally different than a uh, TB granuloma, but it's kind of the same idea where the bacteria are, are now not inside a cell, they're inside this uh, ring of neutrophils that are trying to um, wall off uh, this bacteria and prevent it from getting into the blood. And so um, the bacteria are gonna be replicating, the neutrophils are gonna surround it. The bacteria are gonna be trying to kill the neutrophils. The neutrophils are gonna be trying to kill the bacteria. Um, and uh, they're both actually gonna have a motivation that we're gonna talk about to try to wall this whole structure off. And um, so there, there's a lot of, um, with staph in particular, there's a lot of um, fibrin uh, deposition. And so this is when you get these abscesses. And so. Um, this is again, when you get a cut on your skin, why you clean it right away, because if you get a staph infection in your skin, you get these very characteristic, um, abscesses, which are really neutrophil and staph combinations. Um, if this fails, if the staph wins and kills enough of the neutrophils, it can break through and again, invade and get into your blood. And that can become sepsis very, very, very quickly. Um, I just, as I mentioned as to why this is such a public health issue is uh, there are a number of um, staph strains that are resistant to whole classes of, um, of uh, antibiotics. And so this is actually a list of the antibiotics that are still 
um, able to target MRSA um, uh, resistant staph. This is the one that you hear the most about because the frontline antibiotics that are often used for staph are these um, methyl methylcillin type antibiotics. Um, and so if you use the wrong antibiotic, then uh, the staph has an, a window to grow. Um, there are a number of, of these antibiotics, which are often um, sort of uh, um, toxic or difficult to deliver, have to be delivered by um, IV uh, and so forth. Um, and, uh, but there are a number of new uh, uh, antibiotics uh, still in development or, or being um, uh, introduced, but still kind of a, a concerning uh, area of, um, of, uh, of biology right now is that we have uh, many fewer options in terms of uh, dealing with these uh, pathogens. And that's in part because, uh, again, they can trade genetic information. And once one bacteria figures out how to evade a, a particular antibiotic, they just share that with all of their bacteria friends. And uh, it, it's removed from our uh, ability uh, to use it. Okay, so I, the, the main theme I want to emphasize here is, again, this um, combination of innate and adaptive um, collaboration to, um, to control a bacterial infection. And so your, your first uh, wave of control is going to be through this innate recognition that's going to be done by even a stromal cell, like an epithelial cell, but more likely by a macrophage or a neutrophil hanging out of the skin and monitoring for um, a bacterial invasion. And so um, staph like TB and uh, like strep are going to trigger these really classic pathways on the extracellular surface, the TLRs, uh, via lipopeptides, lipotechoic acids um, that will uh, trigger uh, this NF kappa B signaling, MAP kinase signaling, activation of, um, of these inflammatory genes that will then cause the secretion of individual cytokines that can feed back on the cells. And again, this is going to be another type three IL-17 type response, along with an IL-1 type response, uh, which is often related to the IL-17 type response. So it's another cytokine that can be triggered by innate signaling. We haven't seen a T cell here yet um, that will um, mount this inflammatory response and cause uh, the increase of um, cytokines and growth factors to be released. And so this is a blow up now of um, the skin. So we've got this, uh, these layers of epithelial cells in the skin. So it's much thicker than the lung because we're not doing gas exchange across the skin. Um, and the skin in a healthy state is uh, already secreting antimicrobial peptides, altering its pH and trying to encourage other healthy bacteria to live on the skin. And then way below the skin surface, you have um, some cells of your professional innate immune response, uh, but in, intercalated into the skin, you have, um, again, you, you, you actually do have some memory T cells. If you had prior uh, infection there, you don't have a lot of naive T cells. And then you have um, dendritic cells and, and um, neutrophils and macrophages hanging out. So if staph gets in, it starts trying to invade. It's using this virulence factors, just like strep does, to tear your epithelial layers apart. It's trying to get into these spaces, and eventually it wants to get into the blood. And so uh, if um, uh, all of uh, the cells are recognizing the bacteria via its um, uh, uh, TLR ligands and, and uh, other patterns associated with um, uh, staph itself, um, and that's going to recruit uh, without the role of the adaptive immunity initially, a lot of these uh, innate inflammatory cells like neutrophils. And so the neutrophils are gonna come in and they're gonna cross the uh, endothelial layer. And again, they're gonna open up that endothelial layer and you're gonna have some blood and fluid leaking out. And that's part of why you get red and swollen when you get a cut. Um, and uh, the neutrophil is going to try to kill uh, the staph. And so they'll eat the staph to some extent, um, they will also um, uh, uh, release outside their cells, reactive oxygen species, antimicrobial peptides, proteinases, acid hydros hydrolases. Um, all of these are sort of redundant pathways that are gonna try to just destroy this bacteria, but are also gonna make your skin hurt a lot and kill a lot of your local cells. Um, and then you see on here um, some, this is an antibody, and we're going to talk about now how the adaptive immune response can try to further potentiate this uh, anti-staph response. So um, 
So at the first level, we've got this innate, um, innate cycle, feed forward cycle that's going to try to control staph at the skin surface with macrophages, dendritic cells, and neutrophils. And it's going to be just regulated by this loop of cytokines. And again, those cytokines initially are going to be um, chemokines and then these IL-1 family members that are going to be able to signal through epithelial cells and also signal through uh, uh, neutrophils and macrophages. And again, we haven't seen a T cell here yet. They're just all sensing and then recycling uh, and, and uh, uh, that signal and amplifying it to try to kill the bacteria. And this is evolutionarily much more ancient than adaptive immunity. You have basically these pathways all the way down to flies um, that can mount this type of response that have cell types that are analogous to what we're talking about here. Um, and so then, uh, but say this isn't enough. And simultaneously with all of this activity, you are starting to activate your adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system, like we saw in TB and to some extent like we saw in strep, is really gonna just come in, not necessarily to fundamentally change the pathways that are being used as an effector mechanism, but to amplify them and to license them to act maybe at a higher level and cause even more damage, but uh, damage that's necessary to control the infection. And so uh, let's say we've been dealing with this for several hours or even days and we're not controlling it. We're gonna start calling in the big guns, which are gonna be these T cells that are gonna differentiate into TH17 cells. Again, gamma delta T cells make an appearance here. They tend to be actually somewhat important in the skin. Uh, and, but the goal is gonna be really just to secrete the cytokine IL-17. Again, the skin cells are gonna have their own receptors for IL-17. It's also gonna drive their recruitment, a much greater increased recruitment of neutrophils. So you're gonna pull in this, this signaling that pulls neutrophils out of the blood is just gonna be amplified even further. So you're gonna get more neutrophilia into the skin and they're gonna uh, try to kill um, uh, the staph. Um, so like we saw with TB, uh, there are people that show up with immunodeficiencies that are particularly susceptible to staph. And so what are those? Anything where you have a deficiency in neutrophils, you're going to have a deficiency in uh, staph and you're going to uh, the ability to control staph and you're going to present with staph uh, problems. Um, so these can be genetic or they can be caused by uh, environmental or, or, or uh, historical factors. So um, genetics, you could have uh, defects in the enzymes that make that oxidative burst that make the reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen intermediates. Uh, but you could be neutropenic because of, um, uh, you know, you're undergoing chemotherapy. This is why you get super susceptible to, to disease under those conditions. Um, you could have various granule disorders. Diabetes suppresses the neutrophilic response. And so uh, people with diabetes often get a lot of skin infections. And this is exactly why is they can't mount this neutrophilic response. Um, there are genetic deficiencies in these innate pathways. So a, a key second messenger molecule of TLR signaling and IL-1 signaling is this protein called MITE88. If you have a defect in MITE88, it really manifests as this uh, inability to fight off extracellular bacteria initially. Um, and then if you lose um, on the T cell side, the ability to amplify these signals, and, and this includes in things like uh, HIV, then you can't make that TH17 response, which is gonna be the really sort of turbocharge of the anti-staph immune response. Um, so staph like strep um, has an enormous ar uh, array of proteins that it uses just to try to disrupt your immune response. And so these are additional virulence factors. So it has enzymes to restrict the effects of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen intermediates. So you can see it uh, uh, sitting here blocking all of these um, different pathways. Um, and they're, they're sort of antioxidant enzymes. So it kind of sounds like a good thing. It's like a vitamin you would take. It's enzymes that just see all of these toxic chemicals and they turn them into non-toxic chemicals immediately. So they can actually convert them into something like water. Um, they'll actually try to disrupt the metabolism, the local metabolism in the area so that your cells stop working as well. So they'll deprive your cells of nutrients. It's kind of the reverse of some of the uh, anti-TB uh, approaches where you're trying to starve the bacteria and here the bacteria is trying to starve your local cells. They'll try to kill your local cells. This is uh, the neutrophils, its ultimate enemy. So it's going to have a number of different proteins that just go out and try to kill neutrophils. Uh, and so your cells are going to have to fight back against those and even make immune responses against those proteins so that they can't kill your cells. 
Um, they, um, they have all of these second messengers that try to mimic um, proteins that you make to, to, to traffic cells to particular sites so that your cells go to the wrong place or don't receive the signal to traffic. And then I uh, talked about in the first day uh, that complement is this parallel system that can destroy um, bacteria and can destroy infected cells. So it's a very ancient system uh, and, uh, it's, and it can be incredibly effective against staph. And you know it's incredibly effective against staph because staph makes multiple proteins, all of these pink proteins here that are just specifically targeted to disrupt the complement system in your body. So again, it's this, this, this sort of red queen arms race where we have this great system that is really good at killing staff and staff just keeps developing new weapons to try to disrupt literally every step of this complex multi-step process. <coughs> um, and so um, this extends also to uh, adaptive immune responses. So staff will actually directly try to kill um, B cells. Um, it will, uh, it will, uh, it makes a protein that will actually bind antibodies so that the antibodies, the, the B cell receptor doesn't receive the appropriate signal. And so it can't mature the B cell response. So we know, you know, from our lymphocyte studies that we, um, for our, from our lymphocyte discussions that these antigen receptors signaling through these antigen receptors are the key way that B cells and T cells know that they're seeing the right antigen, that they know to mature, to activate, to go to the site of infection. And staph specifically tries to disrupt this. And one of the craziest things that they do is they secrete this um, uh, protein that uh, was uh, that's called here staphylococcal antigen. It was the first super antigen ever defined. And what, it, what we mean by super antigen is it's a super antigen because it actually uh, is rather than a very uh, highly specific peptide that's going to trigger one specific T cell receptor. It's a super antigen that strongly, strongly, strongly binds um, multiple T cell receptors in an almost non-specific manner. So we actually use staph super antigen as a positive control on our T cell assays because the goal here is for staph to just sort of uh, discombobulate the whole immune system. It overactivates T cells so they actually think something's gone horribly wrong, they're overactivated and they kill themselves. So initially they, they have this massive inflammatory response and then they die. And then they just, because of all of this distraction of this massive non-specific inflammatory response, they don't develop a specific anti-staph adaptive immune response. So uh, again, almost HIV-like in the cleverness of saying, we're just gonna go directly after the T cells and um, almost counterintuitive to say, rather than trying to shut the T cells down directly, we're going to actually just overactivate the heck out of them so that they don't do their um, specific uh, and well-defined job. Um, and then the last couple of points I'll make uh, with staff that are um, unique is that staff actually secretes proteins that induce the clotting cascade in your um, blood. And it does this on purpose to, to form these large clots where you have this agglutinated staph aureus that's pulling in um, uh, the fibrin of your um, blood clotting, like the, blood, the clot that you make when you have a cut um, and other cell types. And that fibrin coat actually protects the bacteria. So it's kind of like the bacteria in MTB hiding out in a macrophage, staph hides out in the middle of this fibrin clot these fibrin clots actually cause some of the problems you have when you have staph because um, you don't want a bunch of random fibrin clots forming. And it also makes it so that the neutrophils and macrophages can't eat the bacteria anymore to clear them out because now they're just in these huge structures that can't be broken down easily. Um, and then uh, my last slide here just sort of uh, um, uh, is relates to both staph and strep. And it's just a point I really want uh, uh, people to hone in on. And it's, it's an area of a lot of focus right now, research wise, which is that both strep and staph are significantly potentiated in terms of their ability to invade and cause severe disease by a prior viral infection. This was a little bit apparent with SARS-CoV-2. It's incredibly apparent with influenza. And it makes sense if you consider that uh, you, you're, all of these uh, diseases, all of these pathogens that we're talking about are trying to get across a mucosal surface defined by an epithelial barrier. And so if uh, you first have a flu infection that infects these epithelial cells, puts them under stress, kills a lot of them, and then forces you know, a regrowth of new epithelial cells that maybe haven't fully matured and fully formed this beautiful epithelial surface, that creates the ideal environment now for these colonized bacteria that were already there to say, 
oh, look, this wall is breaking down a little bit. They're rebuilding it. I'm going to sneak through while they're rebuilding it and get into um, the blood. This is, further, um, this is further complicated by the fact that after you have this big flu infection, you've actually killed off a lot of your alveolar macrophages by direct infection with the virus. So they're not good enough. Um, they're, they're not at their top of their game. Um, and then you also have that regulatory response, that negative feedback response that's coming in to shut down the antiviral response that says, oh, we did a good job. We cleared the virus, that's over. Everybody calm down. Um, that's the perfect moment for a bacteria to come in because it's basically everybody's, you know, gone on vacation because they've just done a, a really hard job getting rid of the virus. And so the bacteria get in, uh, in that window. And there's about a month after you have a viral infection where you're hyper susceptible to bacterial infections, um, because your immune response is actually actively being suppressed by itself because you're trying to work on repairing the lung and, and not causing this uh, uh, um, autoimmune, essentially, uh, pathogenicity. Um, and so, uh, and, and there's not really, it, it, there's not a, a, a great trade-off here because you can't just stay inflamed all the time because you'll consume your own lung and your lung won't be able to function. So you have to have some window where you rebuild these epithelial surfaces and you don't have inflammation but if you're in the right environment where bacteria are around, then that's, you're going to potentially have a problem with this bacteria. Um, so um, I'm going to stop there and uh, we can uh, take uh, you know, some time for questions now.